Welcome everyone to Impact Christian Church. We're excited that you've joined us this morning. We're excited that you've joined us this morning. If you are with us online, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Will you guys stand with us as we prepare our hearts?
are free in him. We have life because of Jesus. Father, we have victory in you and through you. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done for us, and we thank you for your power in our lives. Lord, we know that the battle to redeem us, Father, was not a pleasant one. 
and it was hard and it was painful, Lord. And we just thank you. We thank you for sacrificing yourself. We thank you for the suffering that you endured so that we might spend eternity with you.
blood and in tears How can it be? Is it God who weeps? Is it God who bleeds? To praise to the one Who would reach for me? Hallelujah To the Son of suffering Hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. Sing hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. Hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. Hallelujah to the Son. stripes are my healing Jesus all praise to the almighty King Jesus glory to God in heaven your blood is still speaking and your love is still reaching all praise to the Heavenly Father you are worthy and we thank you for this morning Jesus thank you for giving us breath to be able to give back to you Lord Father thank you for the ability of worship to lay everything down that we have in our minds and in our hearts Lord Father to you you are the truth and we thank you for that. We just pray over Judd as he speaks, Lord Father. And through you, I just pray, Lord, that uh, you are here in this midst. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Oh, thanks, guys. Well, good morning, Impact family. How's it, buddy? Good, good. I hope you had a good week. Hey, I'm just, um, I'm just wondering uh, what your worship time has started off like. Just feeling like, you know, as you come through those doors, sometimes the, the weight of the week is still on you, obviously. That's life. The, the ins and outs and ups and downs of life. And our team does such a good job at, at leading us in this first part of worship. I just want to pray for us right now. Uh, and I want to just ask God to, to relieve us of whatever weight might be on you right now. I want us to be able to hear him clearly. Um, we'll see how that goes as he speaks through me. Uh, that's my prayer. But I want us to just hear God well this morning and, and listen to what he has. So let me pray and I'll, I'll start as well. Father, simple prayer. But we, we come through these doors with, with weight. We come through these doors ready to praise. Some of us are so excited to be with your people and to be in your presence. And some of us, God, come... With, with, with sin in our life. Some of us are coming with, with the weight, with financial issues, with, with relational issues, with, with job issues, with all the things of life. God, I pray that you protect this space this morning. I pray also that you would really enjoy what you hear and sense in us. So God, bless our time together. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, last week, you know, John 9, uh, I read every verse. 41 verses, I told a story as we went through it, which was the way it was led, um, and that was interesting uh, for me and probably for you too, but, uh, and, and Jesus wasn't really in that story a whole lot, he was there at the beginning, if you'll remember, at the beginning he healed the blind man and then he kind of backs away, 
And he comes in at the very end of John chapter 9. And he meets the blind, or the formerly blind man. And then the religious leaders, he gets on them about, about them being blind. Do you remember that? If you were here? If, oh, great. Okay, we need to go over that one again, maybe. Um, but uh, I even used spit in that illustration, if you didn't remember that one. But, um, but John chapter 10, Jesus continues the dialogue. After talking to him about being blind and telling those religious leaders, yeah, you are blind. You are not seeing the things of God. After doing that, then Jesus, chapter 10, is pretty much all red letters. It's pretty much all Jesus talking about. It. But he switches illustrations. He goes from healing a blind man to an illustration of sheep and him being the shepherd. As I look at that text, again, blown away by all that's in there. And this week, a little bit different in my mindset of how God wants me to portray this to us this morning. You know, last week I used all those verses. This week, I'm going to use two of those verses. And you're going, great, now we can get out to lunch. But those two verses are packed with an awful lot of stuff, right? And there's some good stuff here, two verses and a thought or two. John chapter 10, verse 14 says this. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. That's in the first scene of John chapter 10. Then there's going to be another one where Jesus comes back in Jerusalem again. But let's go on to that next one in verse 27. Another scene, he says this, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them. I know them. I know them and they follow me. Known by God. Do you know him? Do you, do you really know him? Not, not do you know about him. Not do you have information and knowledge about him, but do you really know him? You see, there's a, there's a huge difference between knowing God and knowing about God, right? Jesus says this also in Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. He says this line in verse 22 and following. He says, many will say to me on that day, on judgment day, many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, plainly, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I don't know about you, but I've never cast out a demon. Anybody else? <laughs> never cast out a demon, never performed a miracle. Right? Prayed for lots of them, seen God do it, but I've never been the one that actually got to be the key person in some of that other than my prayers, right? Uh, but I've never done that. And most of us would look at a person that can say this to Jesus, that can say, hey, we did all these things, and we would look at a person like that and we'd say, man, that guy's pretty religious. Man, that guy's pretty spiritual. That guy really must know God. But Jesus' words to them are, I never knew you. Think about that. And yet, Jesus basically says to them, that doesn't impress me. Your, your prophecies, your miracles, the things that you are doing, that doesn't impress me. Your position in the church, that doesn't impress me, Jesus says. I want to know you. Well, that makes me smile. And that, that gives me hope. Just like the blind man that could see, God is in the order of doing good things for us and with us. Now check, check this out. Again, in Matthew 25, towards the end of the Gospel of Matthew, at the end of the parable of the ten virgins, which is an illustration of Jesus returning again. You remember the, there was ten bridesmaids, right? And they're trying to, trying to get in to see the bridegroom be a part of the wedding party. Five of them brought enough oil. Five of them didn't. They leave. And God says to those who let their lamps burn out and we're not ready, he says this, I tell you the truth. I don't know you. I don't know you. Notice. Notice, guys. In both of these illustrations, the people, they knew about God, but they did not know God. They didn't know him. They knew about God, but they didn't know him. They had knowledge about God, but they lacked a relationship with God. And what's the difference? What's the difference? The difference has to do with desire. In other words, do you want an academic, intellectual understanding of God, or do you want to know him as your, as your friend? 
as your father, or as the man that was blind in chapter 9, as Dr. Jesus. If you're like me from the 80s, you, you listen to a lot of heavy metal, you listen to country, you listen to just about everything in the 80s, right? Remember that one, Dr. Feelgood? <laughs> yeah, I got some metal heads back there, right? right? All of us with the mullets back in the day, you remember that, right? Dr. Feelgood, not to use them in a sermon very heavily, but <laughs> Jesus is Dr. Feelgood in a very real sense of the matter. How do you want to know God? How do you want to know him? The Pharisees knew God academically. They knew him intellectually. And over and over, they missed God's son, Jesus, who stood right in front of them. They missed him. They were more upset that Jesus healed a man that he made mud last chapter, remember? They were more upset about that than the fact that this man who'd never seen in his whole life could see. They missed God on earth. And friends, I'm worried that some of us are missing, missing God. And some of us in the room, we know God academically. We know him intellectually. Oh, we may have even grown up in the church. We've got, we got all the stars pretending events and being in those things. And we know about him. We know the ins and outs and ups and downs of this book. But we don't know him. God's desire for us is to know him deeply. To enjoy so many benefits that come from an authentic relationship with him. God is offering so much more, friends, than a knowledge-based faith. Look, John 10, 14, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. The key in this relationship is putting yourself into the presence of God. You're going to hear that a lot from me this morning. You're going to hear that a lot from me the rest of your life if I'm here very long. Some of you are thinking, I hope my life doesn't last too long. But the tools that God has given us to do this are simple. We've been saying it all year. It's SPF, right? It's Scripture. The the, the key ingredient to to maintaining our faith, to growing in our faith, to to getting to this area to where we know God, the key ingredients are SP and F, right? We've been saying it. It's being in this book. It's in Scripture. It's in prayer. It's in fellowship. But being in Scripture, think about this. This book does not change. And you want to know God. You want to know who he is. You want to know his characteristics. You want to know the ins and outs and ups and downs about him so you can get to know him deeper. You need to study this book. You need to memorize this book. You need to chew on this book like it's a meal daily, all the time, to know him. You've got to know what his thoughts are. Now, this book doesn't change, so you'll get to know how he doesn't change as well if you spend time in this book. And the second thing which go, goes and coincides with that book is prayer, right? Right? It's prayer. It's open dialogue with God all the time, 24-7 access to him without all kinds of craziness in I don't have to go through a priest. I don't have to go through anybody else. I get to talk to God directly. He invented it. And he invented it for us to use, just like he invented this for us to use. And then the third part of that, S, P, and F, right? The third part is fellowship. fellowship. You guys are getting it. Good. (laughs) Fellowship about hanging out with God's people. It's about dialoguing about what's in this book, and it's talking to other people and saying, what's your life experiences like? How does this passage of Scripture relate to my divorce? How does it relate to my bankruptcy? How does it relate to my job? How does it relate? Every angle of life is covered in this book, and we need to dialogue with each other about it to get those life experiences in a 21st century atmosphere. It's different, believe it or not, in the 21st century than it was in the first century. It's different here than it is in the Middle East. Mediterranean, in, 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 in Israel today, it's different. But yet, the truths of S, P, and F, Scripture, prayer, and fellowship are the same. And they are what bring us into the presence of God. They help us know God, and they help us be known by God. After a week of wrestling with this, over this text, I think God wants me to just focus on one aspect of that. Can I do that this morning? Can, can I show you an example of someone who was not too busy to hear from God. And I say that in this way because most of us, the excuse for not doing S, P, and F, most of the excuses I hear and most of them that I give have to do with my busyness. How about you? I'm too busy. Or, man, I just don't have time today. Maybe tomorrow I'll get into God's word first thing. Maybe I'll do it. What? Busyness. The example I want to share with you this morning is someone who was known by God and who was not too busy. Someone who knew God. Someone who knew the shepherd. Someone who listened to his voice and yet was very busy. Some of you know him. 
Some of you know him better than the person to your left or right. He was and he is known by God. But let me give you a few illustrations, all right? This morning, I, I, I got this. God gave his son Jesus this assignment, right? He pulls Jesus aside and says, hey, son, I need you to go down there to earth, and I need you to show them how to live. I need you to show them not only how to live, but I need you to introduce them to me. I need you to show them that they're really screwing up this thing called the law. I need to show them, you to show them that they've really messed up Sabbath. I need to show them that, that, that I'm fulfilling the law. I need you to show them how much I love them. I need you to show them my character. Son, can you go down there and show them how to live? And I think Jesus is nodding his head and going, yeah, I can probably do that. I really don't want to leave here, but I can do that. And he says, oh, yeah, one more thing, son. I need you to die for them to demonstrate this love. And, son, I'm not going to give you a cyanide tablet. You don't just get to get out of this life easy. I need you to be falsely accused. I need you to be tortured. I need you to be beaten. I need you to be hung on a cross naked in front of the world, sinless. I need you to do that. Can you do that? And Jesus, knowing this assignment, right, he, he gives him this assignment. And, and Jesus, I'm sure, was thinking, man, Dad, that's a, that's a tough assignment. But Jesus knew that in order to fulfill this assignment and be successful at it, Jesus had to stay in touch with his dad. And he knew that the survival to this assignment was authentic communication between he and his dad. Right? Not fake or mechanical, not full of the theological words that you and I don't understand, but genuine, authentic dialogue with his dad. And he also knew that in order for us, 21 centuries later, to have life and faith that God wants us to have, he, Jesus, had to demonstrate it for us, and that is exactly what Jesus did. He demonstrated. So let me illustrate this with four quick stories from the Gospel of Mark. And you say, I thought we were studying John. And I'm like, we are. But I want to I show you some stuff at the beginning of Mark, at the be middle of Mark, and at the end of life. Or if we could say it this way, at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, in the middle of Jesus' ministry, and at the end of Jesus' ministry, I want to show you this communication factor that God and Jesus had. And I also want to do it from Mark so that you can see that what John says correlates with Mark and Peter. If you want to look at Mark that way, Peter's, Peter's insight into Mark, that it all comes together in those four Gospels. At the beginning of the ministry in Jesus, Mark chapter 1, it says this. The Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was out among the wild animals and angels took care of him. Why did Jesus go out into the wilderness for 40 days? Why did he do this at the beginning of his ministry? Luke and Matthew both record that he went out there to fast and pray. And why do we fast and pray? We fast and pray to be in the presence of God. We go into the wilderness. We go into a time of fasting and prayer so that we can get direction from God, so that we can be in the presence of God. We go there to get direction. We go there to get encouragement. We go there to get motivation. Ever needed any of those from God? Ever needed encouragement, motivation, and guidance? Jesus started his ministry. Before he kicks it all off, he goes into the wilderness to be in the presence of his dad. He said, Dad, I don't know about these people. I've been with them for 30 years. It's going to be hard. Something happened out there. That kick-started Jesus, right? How about this? How about not only at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, how about during the ministry of Jesus, right? During the ministry of Jesus, we see several illustrations of Jesus making time to be simply in the presence of God. Mark chapter 1 records it this way. Very early in the morning. That makes some of you upset. <laughs> Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Why? Why would God ask us to get up early in the morning to spend time with him? Why? Because he's worth it. Right? He's worth it. He just healed the blind man's eyes. He's talking to religious leaders that don't get it academically, intellectually. And Jesus himself gets up <clears throat> very in the morning. Now, what we know uh, preceding this is he was highly busy. He was healing people. He was teaching. People were flocking to him. They were surrounding him. And Jesus, instead of sleeping in and resting, which is most of our operation, I need sleep, which is important. But Jesus knows that without this time with his heavenly father, with his dad, he's no good to anybody. He practiced that. Or maybe he just needed to be reassured of his mission in life. He needed to be encouraged by his dad. Or maybe it was just part of his normal day. 
Then there's another section, right? Mark chapter 6, one of my favorite scenes, the feeding of the 5,000. John even records this one, remember? The feeding of the 5,000. The disciples are, are just wasted. Not high, but tired. They're tired. They're beat up. They've been dealing with people's issues all the time. If you're in that kind of an industry, the people business, you understand what they're going through. It's exhausting to deal with you all. I, mean, I love you. These men were tired. And good leadership says you rest your men. You rest your men. So Jesus puts them in a boat. He heads across the Sea of Galilee. Well, Scott was just on last week, right? Sea of Galilee. Heads across the Sea of Galilee. They get to the other side. And in Mark chapter 6, 31 says, he went there to rest his men. And they get there and there's 5,000 men <laughs> waiting on them. Probably more like 15,000 people if you count women and children. They get out of the boat. You know the apostles are like, reverse, right? Let's throw this thing backwards. Jesus, can you do one of those things where, our, where the wind goes this way and pushes us back? No, Jesus gets out of the boat and he says, sorry guys, it's our day off. He didn't do that. He told the men, I need you to find some bread and something. He feeds them miraculously there on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Then at the end of that day, the end of that scene, Jesus puts the apostles in a boat and he sends them across the lake. Then he takes, tells the people, hey, go home, you need to rest too. And he sends them both in that direction. And then look at what happens in verse 46. After leaving them and after they left him, he went up on the mountainside to pray. We don't know what he prayed. We just know that he went to pray. Jesus was tired too. He sends his men out of the scene. He sends the people. He goes up on the mountainside. He watches his men rowing across the lake. He watches the people going back to their village. He watches the sun set. We don't know if he said anything. We don't know if he just sat there and watched it and said, Dad, help. I need help. I need to be encouraged. I need motivation. I need new drive. Or maybe he said, Dad, I get it. I get it. I understand my mission. I just need your help. Guide me. And at the end of that, we know that Jesus was refreshed. You said, Judd, how do you know Jesus was refreshed? It's nowhere in Scripture. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that Jesus went away totally energized like Superman. No, but here's how I know he was energized. Because then Jesus, instead of snapping his fingers or appearing on the other side of the seat of the apostles, he takes off walking across the water. You've seen people do that, right? <laughs> this is why I know he's refreshed, because he walks across the water and he scares the you-know-what out of those apostles. I think the character of Jesus, the quality of Jesus, he just thought, I'm going to go mess with these guys. <laughs> right? And Peter's like, ah, you know, I want to play too. Let me play. Jesus is like, no, I don't know if you really do. <laughs> Good stuff, right? Good stuff. Refreshed by God. Guys, look. Jesus gave us a pattern of being in the presence of God at the beginning of his ministry and throughout his ministry. But maybe the most powerful example of his dependence and relationship with God comes at the end of his ministry. Check this out. At the very last day of his time here on earth, basically, they went to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him. And he became deeply troubled and distressed. Get this. When life was on the line. When the end of his mission was in sight, when pain and suffering was imminent, when doubt and fear was dominating Jesus' mind, Jesus deliberately put himself into the presence of God, leaving you and I a pattern to do the same. Quit trying to do it on your own. Jesus did it. Why can't I? Why shouldn't I? You don't get extra points in the kingdom of God for struggling through life on your own. You don't. Jesus didn't even do that. I like, oh, I forgot to read a line, I think. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Ever had your soul crushed with grief to the point of death? That's pretty serious, my friend. And this is where Jesus was. 
But he put himself in this position. He put himself in position for the crucifixion. Get this, on purpose. He did it on purpose so that you and I would understand how much he loves us. And he was, he was human, and he needed help just like you and I do every day. Verse 35 and 36 say this. <clears throat> he went a little further and fell to the ground. He prayed that if it were possible that this awful hour awaiting him might pass. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Friends, notice this also. Jesus pleads with God for a way out. You ever done that? <laughs> Every day? He didn't want to suffer. He's like you and me in that way. And, and, and yet he left us an example of how to handle struggle and hardship. And here it is. Here's the key. Here's the one thing of SPF I want to show you. Show you. He showed us that prayer is the plan. I may not always have access to this book. I may not have anything memorized, but guess what? I can always access him. I can access him in the car. I can access him right now. I pray in between thoughts even. You can't do. Prayer is the plan in life. And it doesn't matter what the situation, from ecstatic joy to devastating pain and sorrow, guys, every emotion in the book, every emotion that God has given you is possible in prayer. Look, if you're angry with God, guess what? He can handle that. He gave it to you to express it to Him. Good. Look, you're sad. You're angry. You're scared. You're happy. You're excited. You're tender. Any of those things and more, every emotion that you have, He's given you so that you can express it with Him. Why? Because He wants a relationship with you. I don't know how you viewed prayer in the past, but I hope this morning if you're struggling with that, you change your mind, not only on your habit of prayer, but what you can express in prayer. <clears throat> Notice also that Jesus had such a trust in God that he could say, I want your will to be done, not mine. Jesus could say this because, friend, he was known by God. Even in the midst of death coming his way and torture and all those things, Jesus could do that because he knew God. Get this line. He knew God personally because he spent time with him regularly. I'm going to say that again. He knew God personally because he spent time with him regularly. The question is, do you? I know the answer in my life. I can't get enough of it. I cannot get enough of it. How about you? One of the most important things we can do as a Christian is to be in the presence of God and to help others be in the presence of God. Mark Batterson says it this way. Let me read it to you, right? I think it's coming up. Get into God's presence. That is the solution to every problem. That is the answer to every question. God ideas are only revealed in the presence of God. Our biggest problems are only solved in the presence of God. The best plans are birthed in the presence of God. The Holy Spirit will reveal things that can only be discovered in the presence of God. If we hit our knees, the Holy Spirit will give us God ideas for our ministry, for our families, for our business, for our lives. I couldn't agree more. Friend, the simplicity of our faith. It's not a bunch of rules and regulations. It's not about praying a rosary. It's not about all these things. It's about simply being in the presence of God. That's the simplification of what our faith looks like. And this is the answer to everything you struggle with and I struggle with. He is God and he has the answers you and I seek. Guys, man can't fix man's problem. I've said it before. You may have a really good counselor. You may have a really great therapist. And I'm grateful you do. But if they don't know Jesus Christ, if they don't know God, then they can't give you the answers to life. God can. He designed us and he wrote the owner's manuals for our life. Look, look, if your faith is, is stagnant, if it's not where it needs to be and you know it, get into the presence of God. If your relationships are struggling, get into the presence of God. If the relationships in your family are struggling with your kids or with your spouse or whoever, get into the presence of God. Hi, students, if your education, you're wondering about what to do there, if you're struggling, get into the presence of God. 
Look, friend, if your job or your career is not fulfilling or it's not what you think it should be, get into the presence of God. If you're sick, if you've got cancer, if you've been diagnosed with something that's terminal, get into the presence of God. If you're angry, if you're depressed, if you're bankrupt, if you're addicted, get into the presence of God. If you don't know what your future looks like, get into the presence of God. And you say, Judd, that's great, but what does God do when we pray? Here's what he does. First off, he listens. Most of us would do well just to help, just to listen to people. If we're supposed to represent Jesus here on this earth, we need to listen to people. We need to shut up and get out of our own way and listen to people that are right in front of us. That's what Jesus did. But what does he do when we, when we pray? He listens. He takes care of our worries. These are all from Scripture, by the way. He takes care of our worries. He takes care of our doubt. He takes care of our fear. He motivates us. He encourages us. He strengthens us. He heals us. He teaches us. He gives us peace. He gives us marching order. And then like David said in Psalms 23, he restores my soul. Ever had your soul, soul, soul jacked up? I have. You say, Judd, I, I get that, but I don't know how to pray. You just don't understand. I don't know how to pray. And I get that, and I, I used to be that guy. But here's the thing. Yes, you do. Quit telling me you don't know how to pray. Quit telling me you don't, have, you don't read very well and you can't get into this. You can hear it audibly from your phone nowadays. Get into the presence of God and watch your issues drop and watch your eyes get set on the author and the perfecter of our faith, the author and the perfecter of all the universe. Get into the presence of God. Look, A.W. Tozer says it this way. He says, the key to prayer is simply praying. Most of, most of us that, that gripe about it or say, I can't do it or I'm not very good at it, most of you are just making excuses. The simplicity of us is set time and do it. Listen to this next one. Don't complicate it. Make time for it. Look at this next line. Dear God, help me. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, that's a legitimate prayer. <laughs> it works. And most, some of you in the room are going, I've tried. It's not working. Keep trying it. Keep trying. He's listening. Sometimes the thing is, we don't change the mind and heart of God. He changes us. But if we don't spend time with him, if we don't spend time putting these things in front of him, he can't change our mind. He can't change our heart. How about this one? Max Lucado said this. He said, the power of prayer does not depend on the way we say it. Get that excuse out of your head. Or even the one who says it, but the one who hears it. <laughs> prayer is not. Prayer is not telling God what to do, but asking God to do what is right. Prayer is. Presenting your request to God as clearly and as simple as you can. Leaving it with him and saying, whatever you want, I trust you. Do you? You see, it's in those moments of times of prayer where God reminds me. Sometimes with a hard hit on the head, sometimes lightly. But he reminds me, Judge, you, you're not trusting me. And I'm like, ah, I need a different God. <laughs> I need the God that's listening and wanting to do what I want. And he'll be like, you can try. Many have tried. People have even created other gods to try to get that agenda across. But he's like, I, I'm God. You're not. Let me be God. Look, when you gave your heart to Jesus, he returned the favor and he gave his heart to you. He made you, friends, one of his children. Look at 1 John 3, 1. I love this one. Behold what love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. So in other words... When you come to your father, right, those of us that are dads in the room and moms, right, when your children come to you with something, what do you do? You stop and you go, what do you need? And when, he, when he, we come to him, he does the same thing. He stops and he says, what do you need? Because we're his children. And he wants to help us. So, so when we pray, when we come before him, he treats us like children and he says, what do you need? And he may even get down there on your level. And he may say very simply, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Some of us, that's the common answer. <laughs> you don't need that truck. Hmm. Huh. But I do need you to do this, child. You see, 
He has given you authority that when you speak, when you pray, he listens, he considers your request. Friend, I have a challenge for us this morning. It's this, make prayer the plan in your life. One of the greatest things we can do is spend time in the presence of God to help others be in the presence of God. God does the work, not judge, not you. It's his kingdom. And that is why prayer is the plan. It's not that what you're bringing before him, he doesn't know already. He knows, but he loves to hear his children talk with him and commune with him, right? That is why prayer is the plan. So here's the deal. Set a time and set a place. For me, it's mornings. I get up first thing, and then he drives the rest of my day. But I get up, and when I go in the, the bedroom off, the, off of our master bedroom, and I go in there, and I hit my knees first thing, and, and I get down on my face sometimes, and it's very interesting. I don't have any coffee yet. I don't have any of that. Sometimes I'm dead dog tired. I'm just like, God, I'm tired. Other times I get up, and I'm there, and I'm like, God, I got all these things on the agenda today. Or God, sometimes it's thank you for getting me up this morning. Lately, this winter, you know what it's been? I go to my living room. I sit in my recliner, and those in my life group know this. I have bird feeders out on my porch, and Pikes Peaks right out here, and I watch the sun come up, and I just sit with him. And he reminds me of who he is. And he does things like as people walk by, he goes, Judd, pray for that neighbor. And he says things to me like, Judd, see these birds? Why are you worrying about your life? Look at the lilies of the field that are popping up now that your wife spends so much money on flowers for. <laughs> but look at these birds and watch the sunset and watch the fox eat the squirrel that tried to come down that tree. That happened this weekend. It was awesome. Um, but it was cool. Um, set a time, set a place, right? Guys, it's a time and a space for begging and pleading with God. And all emotions are accepted here. God created them all. It's a place also for silence and solitude. And here's, here's what I want to tell you this morning. This answer, this response of being too busy, that's on you. And here's the thing. Busyness is not godliness. It's not a badge of honor. In Matthew 7 that I shared at the beginning, when Jesus says, you do all those things for the kingdom, for this, you, you cast out demons, all this, he says, I still, I don't know you. Busyness prevents us from being inside. I told you last week I have a, now she's a week, a month old baby granddaughter, Paxton. I love holding her while she sleeps. How many of you guys have ever held a baby while they slept? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, drool's coming out of their mouth and, and sweat. You got all that. But there's something very therapeutic. There's something very incredible about watching a child sleep, right? Number one, cheap entertainment. Number two, you wish you could sleep like that. <laughs> you wish you could bend and shape like a baby, right? You're a child of God. He's dead. And some of you in this room this morning just need to jump up into his lap. And you need to allow him to be dead. And you need to let him rock you to sleep. And you need to let him take the cares and the worries of this world and let them go away. Band, if you want to come on up, I'll close this up. Here's the thing. This sounds really bad. You're going to fail. You're not going to bat a 1,000, right? But don't beat yourself up about that. God is excited that you're trying. And Satan's going to do his best to try to stop you, just like he did with Jesus. But Jesus showed us. He showed us that the importance of being in God's presence at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end, all throughout his ministry, he showed us that prayer is the key to survival and health as a Christian. He did it. Why did he do it? He didn't need to, or maybe did he? And if he needed it, you do too. Friends, God hears you, the good shepherd. All of this from two verses in John. God hears you. He created prayer for us to deepen our relationship with him and, and accomplish kingdom things. And we have a role model who simply prayed. Jesus made time. Jesus made time to be in the presence of God and was therefore known by God. And I pray that you will follow the pattern of Jesus and make prayer the plan in your life. And I pray that you will be known by God. I am the good shepherd. 
I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Let me pray. Father, thank you for inventing prayer. Thank you for these simple illustrations of how you prayed and showed us how to pray, when to pray, why to pray, all the above. God, thank you for giving us access to you. Wow. Lord, may we, we become the praying people. May we rely on you. May we hunger for you. May we desire a walk with you that is deep, deep, deep. God, may you do for every one of us in the room like Elijah. God, may we, may we not experience death. We know you so well that you just take us from the earth. How cool would that be? Father, we want what you offer. Help us get there. In Jesus' name, amen.
can be in the space between all these things and see and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. I know I will never be alone. I know I will never be alone. Come on, there'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever be reminded, how could you bend to me? I've kept a torch of every battle. Cause I know that's where you'll be I can see, come on church And I can see the light In the darkness As the darkness bows to Him I can hear the roar In the heavens As the space between west and I can feel the ground Shake beneath us As the prison walls came in Nothing stands between us Nothing stands between us Be another in the fires Standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I've kept the joy from every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be That's our prayer. I'll count the joy and come every battle. Cause I know that's where you'll be. I'll count the joy and come every battle. Cause I know that's where you'll be. You may be seated. We're going to take communion together in a moment. If you have not received a, a cup like this, Please raise your hand. The ushers will be glad to come and bring you one. If you need one, just raise your hand up high. But when you get it, hold on to it. I'd like us to take communion together in a moment. I want to share a thought with you. As Judd mentioned, I was in uh, Israel in the Holy Land for the last week and a half or so. Just got back and thank you, Judd, to, for your sharing of God's Word today. That was powerful. Some of what he talked about uh, fits perfectly with what I want to share with you. Um, two different places that I was at while I was there, one of which... Before Jesus went to the cross, before he died on a cross much like this for us, the Bible records that uh, a number of other things happened. In particular, let me share with you um, here from Matthew 26. This is just part, just one part of the story. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. Peter was following at a distance. This is after he had denied Jesus. As far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. That's Peter. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This man said, I am going to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make to Jesus? What is this that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest, Caiaphas, said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you, Caiaphas, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then Caiaphas tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have heard him. You have heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? Then they all answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him. Some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who struck you? And the scene continues. Most of you know the rest of that story. It culminates with Jesus dying on a cross for us before then rising from the dead three days later. But we're going to take some time and we're going to 
thank him for what he did on a cross like this. But that scene there happened at Caiaphas's house. And while I was in the Holy Land, we got that's one of the places we went. The ruins are there. The house has been rebuilt. But they excavated it not long ago, like maybe, I can't remember, a decade or two ago, something like that. And they found underneath it something they didn't know that was there. But there's a dungeon under the house of Caiaphas. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us that Jesus was put in that dungeon, but there's a definite possibility of that. Anyway, we went down into that dungeon, and with a bunch of other pastors, while we were in that small dungeon looking at the place of torture that was clearly used for many, and maybe for Jesus, definitely Jesus was tortured. We just read that he was slapped, he was punched, he was spit on, all those things. He Later, Pilate sentenced him to the 40 lashes, save one. All these things happened to him. And then eventually he was brutally murdered and put on a cross. Like Judd said, he didn't... Jesus intentionally picked a time on this earth's history timeline when torture was at its worst. I mean, if he'd have been born in this century and sentenced to die, what, lethal injection or something like that would have happened if he was sentenced to die? But then... Torture was at its worst, and Jesus picked that time in history partly for that reason, I believe. Anyway, while he was there, maybe being tortured in that dungeon that I stood in, what, five days ago or something like that, um, one of the other pastors turned to me and he goes, Scott, think about this. And it really struck me. He said, think about this. Jesus was there. He's tortured but he could have, the Bible says, called down six, 12 legions, 12 legions of angels, which a legion of angels means about 6,000. A legion is roughly 6,000, generally speaking, or even more, but at least 6,000 times 12. Jesus could have done that. Do the math with me. 12 times 6 is what? 72. So 72,000 angels were at Jesus' beck and call just like that, he could have called them. And even one angel, we know from a story in 2 Kings 19, when, the, when God's people were facing the Assyrians, one, one angel took out 185,000 armed soldiers. One angel. So 185,000 potential deaths at the hand of one angel times 72,000 angels that Jesus had at his beck and call. That equals 13.3 billion people that with one word, if Jesus had wanted, if he did in the middle of all that torture wanted, he could have said, stop, no, anything along that line, and it would have ceased. And with one word, he could have brought enough, enough lethal force to take out 13.3 million People, I mean, obviously, or billion, sorry, billion people, there were only roughly, according to historians, roughly 300 million people on the face of the earth at that time. So, if again, just for the sake of math, if you do the math, he could have wiped out the earth 44 times with one word, 13.3 billion, 72,000 angels, 185,000 people per angel, if you think about it like that. All of that power was at Jesus' beck and call. He could have, as he's being spit on and punched and beaten and eventually nailed to a cross, he could have said, stop, no, and undone it all. And as I was in that dungeon thinking about that and thinking about a cross that he was soon to go to, my friend, my, the other pastor said, think about, Scott, why he chose not to. As he was maybe in this dungeon that we're standing in, on the way to all the rest of the story and the brutality that was coming his way, he could have said stop, but he chose not to. Why? Because as he was being beaten and punched and kicked and, and whipped and eventually put on a cross, he had you and I in his mind's eye. And as we take communion right now, if you will, take your cup. Take the small piece of bread first. I want you to remember or think about his body and just picture. I mean, it's brutal. It is horrific. But picture his body being ripped to shreds, beaten, punched, all the above. And picture him picturing you and saying, you're worth it. You're worth it. So think about that.
and likewise open it up to the juice. Jesus told his disciples just before this moment, do this in remembrance of me. This blood, this juice represents my blood that will be shared, spilled. Picture him doing that and again saying, I'm doing this because you are worth it. And take a minute and just tell him thank you. Dear God, thank you. I, I don't, uh, I, I hesitate to talk out loud, to pray out loud in a moment like this when we're all trying to tell you thank you because words cannot, cannot accomplish what is needed here in terms of expressing gratitude. Lord, I don't deserve that. None of us do. But we thank you. I don't know what else to say, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. And I pray that as we move forward in life, as we contemplate what you want from us in terms of how to honor you and live our lives for you, help us, Lord, to just picture you giving all and help us to look at our opportunities to give back to you as, as simply a way to just say thank you again. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we take up an offering, we do that every Sunday. Um, I just, I want to make it clear that we don't do that because, because God doesn't ask us to take up an offering because He needs your money, right? He has everything. He, he, he asks us to give in return because it changes who we are, and it helps us be committed to Him. Judd preached about the same passage, but also in the passage I just read, the Bible talks about how Jesus. While he was in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, which I was there as well less than a week ago, and there are trees there. I didn't have time to get one of the pictures to show you, but, um, but there are trees there that scientists have dated back to well over 2,000 years ago, and it's not a large garden. It's not a big area, and so as I early in the morning, we got there before the rest of all the people, lots of people in Jerusalem. We got there before all the hordes of other people, and we got to spend some time alone in prayer, leaning against some of those ancient olives trees and touching and sitting there, being there, and just imagining Jesus might have been sitting at this tree, or maybe it's that one, maybe it's that one, but in this area. And as he did, as you know probably from Scripture, the Bible says that Luke, the doctor, is the one who records. Luke, being a doctor, would be more in tune with physical things. He recorded that Jesus' sweat became like drops of blood. I looked it up. There is a term for that. Judd and I were trying to figure out how to say it. I think it's... May not mess it up. Herma... Okay, wait a minute. <sighs> okay, one more time. Uh, hemato... No, okay. Hematomosis. Okay, that was terrible. But that's... <laughs> I'm not a doctor. Okay, Luke was. I'm not. But it uh, is a true physical condition that may occur in individuals suffering from extreme levels of stress, this website says. Around the sweat glands, there are multiple blood vessels in net-like form which constrict under great times of stress. Jesus was under stress because of his love for you and I and what he was about to endure, and he literally sweated drops of blood. And so when we think about giving back to him, when I think about giving back to him, I think of what he gave me, and I think, oh, wow, Lord, I can never give enough, but help me to not hesitate to give whatever you lay on my heart. So let's just pray and ask God to lay on our heart what is appropriate, and then just follow suit. Lord God, as we come before you and we think about giving, whether it be our money or our time, our heart, there are so many elements of us. Lord, help us to not think about giving you some, even a 
big chunk. Help us, Lord, to think about giving you all, everything we are, everything we have. And whatever the amount looks like when it comes to finances, God, lay on our heart what you think is right and help us to just follow suit, remembering what you gave us. Thank you, Lord, for what you did for us. Thank you again. We pray in the name of our Lord, our Savior, the one who died for us, your Son. His name is Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. And everybody all together said, amen. amen. Sandy, would you come? How are you guys doing? Have you had a good day of worship in the house of the Lord? Yes. yes. I've got just a couple of announcements for you. Belong is this Tuesday at 6.30. If you've never been to Belong, if you're curious about what goes on here at Impact, come meet with us. We'll all be there. We have treats, food. I mean, come on. You're coming for the food if nothing else, right? But if you have any questions about Impact, come to Belong this week at 6.30, Tuesday night. There is a... Um, sheet out on the left side of the table. We do need you to sign up so we know how much food to have. So please, if you're interested, go sign up in the back. Camps. We have camps coming this summer, guys. Yeah! We are ready to take your kids off your hands for a week. Come on! So we have high school first. That week has changed. So look in your bulletin. The week has changed. Just so you know, if you've already signed up, make sure you check that. We have Prospector, which is third through fifth. And then we have Middle School, which is the, our last camp. But the camp I am really coming to talk to you about is Space Camp. So Space Camp is right here at our church. We had Adventure Camp last summer. This year we have Space Camp. Guys, we need your prayers. We need you to be on your knees praying about this week at camp. We would love to have 200 kids at our camp this summer. We had about 140 to 160 last year. Our goal is 200. We want to reach this community for Jesus. That is our goal, for all kids to know Jesus. And we need your help to make that happen. We need volunteers. We, it takes about 60 people to run this camp. And then we need some van drivers. We want to go out into the community. We need four people who would be willing to drive vans to pick up kids every morning and then take them home after camp. We need donations. Guys, feeding 200 kids a day, it gets expensive, okay? And just let alone the crafts. We have um, some little tags in the back that you could pick up of craft items that are needed. Also, if you'll go back to the table, and if you have any questions, just go back to that table. We'd love to talk to you about it. We'd love to have you help. We need everything from security to space camp leaders to junior space camp leaders to people who love to do games, crafts, snacks. We need it all. We would love to have you join us for a fun-filled week of learning about Jesus and how he made this earth. So come join us. And... Our last announcement is next week we'll have John 11, and Scott will be back up, correct? Okay, Scott's back up preaching. So you guys go out into the community this week, tell everyone about Jesus, most important thing you can do, okay? Love you guys, have a good day.